Hey guys, you ever thought to yourself, where the heck is the lab experience going for great restorative dentists? And I need a new way to think about it. And also, what do I listen to? Like I listen to a lot of education. I want to go to some events, but I want something fresh, new, exciting, makes me think, makes me laugh. Well, if you ever ask those two questions, I've got the perfect guy for you, Dr. Mike Detola, who's one of the best of all time. I think this guy is one of the best entertainers. Uh, they'll get, get you thinking, and uh, you don't want to miss this. So do me a favor. Grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to love this. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. My name is Kirk Barrett and I'm your host. And so I am just so glad you're here and boy, are you in for a treat today because we got the best looking bald guy in all of dentistry, <laughs> one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet. And if you've ever seen him speak or present or do a podcast or do anything, not only is it wildly entertaining, but it's thoughtful, it's insightful. Um, I never lose track of focus. I mean, there's a lot of speakers or people I listen to that you're like, I wonder what I should eat today or what should I, this guy will keep you on your toes at all times and you don't want to miss this. So if you're here for the first time, I always do like, uh, to do a couple things, you know, during the COVID conference, we had over 38,000 of you opt in, uh, during the conference. And some of you are finding yourself over to the podcast. And you're like, what the heck is this? Hey, do me a favor. If you're listening to Spotify or Stitcher, or iTunes, I don't care where you're consuming podcasts. If you're on your phone right now, do me a favor, go right down to the subscribe button and just hit the subscribe button because I want you to show up every single week. Cause you're going to see every single week, I'm going to bring you a brand new expert in dentistry. Somebody that's going to give you some great things to think about so you can create a better practice and a better life. So do that. Secondly, if you haven't joined our private Facebook group, join us over there. We're over 13,000 of you joined us during the conference. I honestly still don't even know how it works, but the truth of it is, is that it's a great community of people just asking questions, saying, hey, what about this? And you're going to see it's a great community of people that are just willing to help. And then lastly, if you're a dental practice owner and you're thinking, gosh, my practice, it's just tough. I think, gosh, it could be a little bit better. I mean, it's been a good couple of years, but man, how do I make it a little bit better? Join us over at actdental.com. We're a practice coaching company. So if you're looking at ways to improve your team, your profit, your time, anything, join us there. We've got Act Dental U. We've got a team of coaches that are here to help you because you get one shot at this thing called life. But you know what? And the coolest thing about dentistry, there's no rules. You can have a single doctor practice. You can have a multi-doctor practice. You can do whatever you want. It's important. You just do what you want to do. Now, I want to introduce my guest today because he's truly one of the best. Now, I'm going <laughs> to... You know, I'll never forget. I got to say this is that you, you want the, one of the first conversations we had, and I don't know if you remember this, we were in Hinman and we were in the college football hall of fame and you come up to me and you go, Hey, 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 look, there's not room for two good looking guys that are funny. <laughs> and I'm like, listen, you're, you're the only good looking, funny guy in dentistry. And you're like, okay, as long as we got that straight or whatever. And then that night you and I, and I think John Coyce was standing in between us and I laughed so hard. I mean, I've seen you speak so many times and just being with you makes me laugh out loud. And every time I've had a conversation with you, uh, I always leave going, man, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Now I know who you are. And I know a lot of people listening know who you are, but if, if a young dentist is watching this and they don't know who Dr. Mike Detola is, let's start there. Who's Dr. Mike Detola? Okay. Well, Kirk, thank you so much for having me. I'm joining your Facebook group uh, <laughs> as we speak. Um, there we go. Pending. Pending. What the hell? Hey, Pending. We, what do we, I have to do we, to get into this group? We got to filter on it. We got to keep some of the riffraff out. Yeah, well, um, my name's uh, Dr. Mike Detola. I uh, live in uh, Southern California, and I graduated from dental school a long time ago, 19, uh, 
88 from the University of the Pacific, and I was in um, private practice for about 15 years. And then one of my patients um, was one of the Crown and Bridge managers at Glidewell Dental Laboratories. And uh, as I was working on him, he starts saying, hey, we're building this operatory and we're starting to use this new Crown and Bridge material called CapTech, which doesn't even exist anymore. But at the time, it was a, kind of the new hot thing. And, and he said, would you ever come over? and work on some patients so we could film it and try in some some of these different cap tech crowns and see what they look like and uh, i said sure and i started doing that on fridays where i wasn't going out and lecturing and I had so much fun doing it and uh, it forced me that's when i actually became started to become a better dentist i was pretty mediocre the first 15 years of my career and then when i started it would start being filmed and put up on a huge screen this is like posing naked next to a ruler. Um, there's just no excuses you can make. And even if you do, no one's gonna believe it because they're looking at you in the ruler. And so as you right. saw my preps up on the uh, the screen, it was, it was clear that I needed to get uh, better. And so um, I did that for the next 15 years and we put out a lot of uh, clinical content. It was at the very beginning of YouTube, you know, like in 2006 when that came out and we put up our first video and then our second video and with zero subscribers today, there's over 90,000 subscribers. So it was clear that Dennis wanted to see uh, somebody presenting kind of everyday dentistry being done in a way to hopefully reduce remakes and get better aesthetic results. And then from there, I went to Sorona for a couple of years because um, we saw it at the lab. We saw that chairside CAD cam. Uh, was the future. I still believe that. I went to run a dense ply bottom and uh, a lot of things had changed there. Uh, and by that, I mean most of the people who worked for Serona were uh, pushed to the side and uh, and quietly let go. And then since, since then, I've been doing consulting uh, for companies. And most interestingly, Kurt, I think I'm kind of doing my um, career backwards. I just bought a dental practice. You, you know, much die. like yeah, much like you probably experienced in 2020, it was weird when all the lectures we were supposed to do canceled all of a sudden. All of a sudden, these 38 dates go up in smoke, and then most of uh, 2021 goes away as well. And I started getting antsy because for me, uh, all, all the virtual Zoom presentations and virtual meetings kind of weren't doing it. It wasn't the same as going out and, and meeting with people. And um, I decided, you know what, I kind of miss working on patients um, in the sense that uh, I didn't want to go back in and just be crushing it five days a week, but I do want to be there three or four days a week seeing, you know, a couple patients in the morning, a couple patients in the afternoon, filming it, doing interesting things and creating more clinical content and being able to keep my fingers wet, a disgusting saying, but something we say <laughs> in dentistry when we call each other wet fingered uh, dentists as though we're not wearing gloves. Um, but uh, that's what um, what I've been up to. And um, so I'm looking forward to next month to getting back uh, into it and uh, starting to see patients again and create some clinical content. Yeah, so I did not know, you know, before we went live, he didn't tell me that you bought a dental practice. I forgot <laughs> oh, <you laughs> until the intro. Okay, because that slips my mind. All right, yeah, because you forget that kind of stuff. Like I'm saying I need your help, Kirk. Please help. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, you're going to help us stay. Now, this guy, and again, like of all the speakers I've ever seen, there are so many times where I was laughing so hard that I missed the line before. And so now you graduated from Pacific in 88, okay, which yeah. is great dental school. I bet you have some great stories from this, but this is what I want, really want to, what's the craziest thing that ever happened to you speaking anywhere? When I say craziest thing, like you're like, oh my gosh, there was one time, anything come to mind offhand when it comes to speaking on the road? Yeah, well, yeah, there was um, there was this group called, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this group called, um, it was called Generation Next. It was kind of yeah. spelled like G-N-R, the number eight, like a couple hashtags or, and then maybe like an asterisk and an ampersand. But it, somehow it's spelled like Generation Generation Next and it looked like a, someone's password for an internet account. And um, they said, uh, we're doing this event in Cancun. Will you come down? and just do like uh, like dental stand-up comedy uh, for like a half hour. And I was like, yeah, that, that'd be great because I, you know, there are enough um, funny stories um, in, in my lecture and things to be able to kind of tie it all together. And then just other stuff that um, I think is funny that I can put together into a good uh, half hour. So I said, yes, and I went down there and, um, you know, I, I didn't think too much about it because it was like a three-day meeting. 
And, uh, uh, you know, when I got down there, I was like, hey, when's my time slot? And they said uh, noon. I said, OK, what day? And they said, uh, we're doing it on Saturday. I said, OK, awesome. Can I go take a look at uh, the meeting room and, and see what it looks like? And they said, oh, you're going to be doing it uh, on the beach. Okay. I was like, on the beach? And they were, yeah, we're, we're setting up a stage out there and have, we're having like an outdoor bar. And we're going to be doing it on the beach. I was like, on the on the beach. All right. And uh, it's Kirk. It was just the worst experience ever. The wind was um, coming from uh, behind me. So the speakers were set up, you know, so the crowd could kind of hear it. Um, but it, the, the wind was kind of, believe it or not, the wind can like blow sound out of the way. It was um, daylight. It was like uh, almost 90 degrees outside. So everybody was kind of sweating and miserable. It was loud on the beach. The waves were much louder than I think anybody expected. So I'm, I'm screaming into the microphone. I'm annoying everyone else on the beach that's not with this meeting. So it's not like it was a private beach. There was like other families and, and trying to figure out and looking at me and wanting to know why I'm you know yelling these jokes uh, about cuspidors and saliva ejectors and black hairy tongue and things like this. And um, the the Corona girls were off not that not that far um, doing like a promotional thing on the beach and everybody was much more interested in them including the entire dental audience that was sitting on the beach and uh, I remember I was like oh this is this is the worst experience ever I hope this is almost done and I looked down and I was like three minutes into it and I was just like oh uh, God of tsunamis or whoever is in charge of these types of natural disasters please end it for me now. It was literally the most excruciating uh, half hour of my life. And this is back, Kirk, by the way, talking about good looking bald guys. This is where I was still wearing the hairpiece oh, that no. I got to appease uh, my ex-wife. And uh, so I was still wearing that. So I had this uh, ferret glued to my head that was increasing just my general personal heat and personal swampiness. And, and then just the flop sweat of bombing on a beach uh, at midday with the sun straight overhead just was leading to this not only pit sweating but sweat just dripping down my face and the hairpiece getting loose wanting to slide off to the side it was um the the worst lecture experience ever for me anyway <laughs> You went from Mike Totola to Sam Kinison in no time, right? <laughs> exactly. Now, I got to go back to this because I'm follically challenged. And when you told me now in our first podcast, you told me the hairpiece story and that like I'm extra sensitive because I've been combing my hair, doing the comb over since I was 14. And I think if I had my wife come home and make me wear a hairpiece, that would have been. Like that would have been tough on me too. And I've actually worn one just joking around and my kids are like, Oh my gosh, you got to get that thing off. <laughs> so, well, yeah, she didn't like make me like put a, a gun to my head, but I did come home one day and there was a brochure from a plastic surgeon who specialized in hair replacement surgery sitting on the counter with a post-it note that said, you know, Michael, I made you a consultation appointment and we never talked about this. I was just like, oh my God, this is like if I got one from a breast enhancement special, a breast augmentation specialist and left it for her saying, hey, I love you as a B cup, but as a large C, small D, I'd love you. I mean, this is just insulting. This is passive aggressive to the nth degree to just leave something out like that. But, you know, at the time we didn't, I didn't have good communication skills and I didn't realize um, that uh, I, you know, that mentally, um, I was, uh, you know, I have a condition and then I was, you know, kind of a people pleaser. And so I just kind of did it and we never talked about it. And, uh, it was, it was crazy. And, and yeah, the story I told you is about uh, the day that I took it off for the, the first time and it's never gone back on since. So very liberating. Oh my gosh. This is so good. Um, now today we're going to be talking about reshaping the lab and I, we're going to talk about your new podcast and you've been part of it, but like, take us on this journey where are we at in dentistry? Like you've been doing this a long time. You've been involved in teaching dentists. You've watched the changes in the, in the, you know, educational uh, lab landscape. I mean, where are you at with, you just bought a dental practice. Like give us a state of the union. Let's say I'm a young dentist watching. Like I'm 32. Like tell me where we're at when I see a map of you are here in dentistry. Well, you know, it's gotten, it's gotten really good. I mean, if you if you just compare it back to what we were doing in uh, 
1988. I mean, I mean, typically, uh, Dennis used to have a tendency of talking about the golden age in dentistry, which was um, always loosely defined as like 10 years before you graduated. And that's when things, or 20 years, that's when things were really good. They had, there was no insurance, there was no this or that. Um, but, you know, you go back, all you have to do is go back and you'll find how bad things really were. And as technology, you know, gets better and better, it becomes easier and the patient experience gets improved. But one thing that largely hasn't changed from when I graduated is the two week turnaround time that a dentist takes from the time they prep a crown to where they seed a crown. And practicing inside of Glidewell Laboratories, I was in a building with 835 uh, dental technicians in it. Uh, three of them were really good. And out of those three, I worked with this one, Cindy, all the time. And um, and so Cindy was just you know literally down the hallway from me. And so I didn't have to wait two weeks to get my crowns back, but I was really in the habit of seeding crowns after two weeks. And so that's when we were reappointing people and we were making so many adjustments. I, I thought, how is this happening? Here I have, you know, who I consider the best technician in the laboratory, hand building these crowns for me and we're putting them in and I'm still having to make these adjustments, too many adjustments, her beautiful work, you know, once they taught me to start prepping enough because that was one of my big problems was under prepping. Why am I having to adjust these crowns? And that's when I started experimenting well with, well, the crown's back now, like on day two or day three, let's try cementing it now. And that was the big eye opener uh, for me, Kirk, was that going from waiting two weeks to cement a crown to three days is a game changer. I mentioned earlier that I left and went to Serona where you can do same day crowns. And that is uh, an ideal that we should stretch for, but we're still kind of waiting for uh, a really affordable value-based system that's easy to use before most dentists dip their toe into that making restorations chair side. But seating it the same day should certainly be our goal, at least for single unit posterior crowns. But every dentist knows that if a patient is away for six weeks or eight weeks or six months with a temporary on, when they come back to have that permanent crown be cemented, the chances of it fitting decrease as that time increases. And I'm here to tell younger dentists that the opposite is true, that when you start seating crowns after three days instead of two weeks, your need for adjustments almost disappears. And really the problem here is twofold. Most dental laboratories aren't willing to turn a crown around that quickly. And they will actually tell you that it takes longer to fabricate a crown and make it, which just isn't true. I mean, it, it take, you can make an Emax crown the same day, you make a zirconia crown the same day, it needs to center overnight, but it's ready on the second day. Really what the problem is, the labs aren't hiring enough employees to be able to handle this workflow. And since dentists just have always said yes to two week crowns, that's how it's always been. And that, that got started like way back in the 50s when the first PFM crown was being made. And the lab guy, when he made the first crown back in Detroit in 1959, asked the dentist, he said, uh, when do you want this back? The dentist like, I don't know. What do you think? And the lab tech's like, well, it's a busy week. Then we're going to the lake house this weekend. And then, oh, it's spring break. I don't know. How's two weeks? And then it goes, yeah, that's fine. And boom, it was set in stone. And, etched for, and forever there it would stay. So the first problem is laboratories, most of them are unwilling to get you a crown back in three days. The other part of it is we have to do our end, which is get them the impression literally five minutes after we're done with the prep. And that means we're going to have to take a digital impression and then electronically send this impression to the laboratory so they can start working on that crown. But Kirk, I'm here to tell you that there's nothing that you or any of your practices will find more impactful in terms of impressing the patient, reducing the amount of adjustments you have to do, which is really important, not just from being lazy, but anytime we take a burr to a crown, um, even if you polish away all the scratches on the surface, there's still tiny little micro fractures under the surface that you can't see that connect over time and cause failure. And the crowns are less aesthetically pleasing. And anytime a crown gets thinner, it's more prone to break anyway, besides these micro fractures that are in there. So our goal should be not to have to touch any crowns. Our goal should be to drop a crown from a foot above the prep and it poof, just sucks into place. And for that to happen, this three-day turnaround is, is really important. And uh, there's just not that many labs willing to do this three-day turnaround. And we need to all kind of implore our labs to do it. And just to tie this up really quickly, Cindy, that technician from Glidewell, who I worked with for those 15 years, um, now has her own laboratory that all they do is three-day crowns. 
And in fact, if you go to three day crowns.com, you will actually see this laboratory 38 smiles and how they do three day turnaround. They'll get it back to you on the third day, especially with the digital impression. If you set it the old fashioned way, you just have to tack on those extra days, but they will get it back to you in three days. So you can start to see the kind of revolution here. So maybe we should all be heading to same day dentistry, but that's a hundred thousand dollars and a lot of training to learn how to design and make crowns. In the meantime, three day crowns is a perfect stopgap and it's going to give you 90% of what you get uh, from that same day restoration. I love it. I love it. And when you were talking about reshaping how people think about the lab process and how it all works, you know, go a little bit deeper with that, you know, cause you, what you're alluding to is dentists are using the seven most expensive words in business, which is that's the way we've always done it. It's always been two weeks. I've always done it that way. And inherently, as you're describing the whole process, we've got to be able to take the image, send the image. You can see all the challenges that are built in it. And like you're hell bent on this, this new vision for, um, you know, changing the way people look at this whole process. And is that what you're, is that what you're talking about? Reshaping the lab experience? Yeah, because it starts in dental school, you know, in, de in dental school, we don't even do most of our own lab work, you know, it gets sent either to an outside laboratory or a central laboratory within the dental school. So it might be two or three weeks till we see it. And um, we're never taught in dental school, oh, by the way, this should be three days, but due to the, you know, the constraints of a dental school, we can't get this done for three weeks. We, we just assume that's the right way. To in fact, there's no talk whatsoever in my recollection about why it is here. In fact, you can Google it all day long and look for references and you'll never see any research study showing that two weeks allows for um, the inflammation and the pulp to go down or anything that happens uh, good in two weeks. Nothing good happens while the temporary is on. Nothing. I mean, besides like, I don't know if the patient needs uh, a week to get a payday loan or something to, to pay for the second half, but nothing good structurally happens um, be, because the best thing we could do is prep a crown and then immediately cement the crown in place or like an hour later with chair side CAD cam. So anything we do besides that is is a compromise and the compromise just get worse, gets worse the longer that we let it go. And the issue is that our, our well-meaning dental assistants, especially if we don't reinforce this, they want to make sure, you know, the one part that they touch and kind of have the final say over in most practices is the temporary crown. And so a lot of dental assistants take a lot of pride in the temporary crown. And the one thing they're going to do is make sure it's insanely smooth so that it doesn't bother the patient's tongue when they touch, when they rub it up against there, or it's not bothering their cheek or anything like that. And as a result, when they make the temporary crown, dental assistants with all the right intentions and with big hearts over polish temporary crowns, specifically the occlusal surface and the biting surface, Kirk, and then the uh, adjacent, the mesial and distal contacts at the same time. And when that happens, especially on the occlusal surface, if for two weeks that temporary crown is not touching the tooth across from it, one of those two teeth is going to rotate and start to move until it contacts searching its opposing tooth. And that's why I noticed at Glidewell, we had so many complaints about the bite was too high. I had to grind on the crown too much. And so I started going down for the doctors who complained the most. And I would look at their cases as they left, went out on the FedEx trucks that day. And I checked their crowns. They were perfect on the models. And yet the doctor would complain a week and a half later that the bite was too high. And I began to realize my own assistant was doing this as well, because we don't reinforce the basics to them. Quality kind of always slips unless you make a concerted effort to keep it at the same level or higher. It's just human nature. And when we do the same routine thing over and over, you just start, you kind of go on autopilot sometimes. And so we have to make sure that our, our assistants know that there's a centric stop. So I would challenge any dentist watching this. This isn't like gotcha journalism, but just tell your assistant for the next couple of days, hey, before you let any of these crown patients, before you dismiss them, let me come in and check something real quick. And just go in and take a piece of active film too and check and see if there's a centric stop on the temporary crown. Because what happens is the assistant polish it and polish it, and then they ask the patient, how does it feel? And the patient goes, great, I can't feel it at all, which is good in the sense that the patient is happy, but it's bad in the sense that there's probably not a centric stop on that temporary crown. It will super erupt or the opposing tooth will, and not in a straight line fashion like we'd like to picture it. They, the maxillary tooth has a tendency to rotate from the palatal towards the facial to come in contact with that lower tooth during those two weeks. And when you go to try the permanent crown and it will be high and you're like, what the hell's wrong with my lab? 
You know, it seems like 70% of my crowns are high. And as a result, Kirk, what we've had to do in the lab is start designing crowns 400 microns out of occlusion to make up for this. So that's been our solution as an industry, as the laboratory industry is not. Let's tell, let's start this movement with the dentist to say, hey, get a digital scanner, send us the impression five minutes after you're done, we'll get it back to you in three days. So that even if your assistant over polishes the temporary, the effect of that will only be over those 72 hours instead of 14 days or more, thus minimizing the effect of the temporary crown on the fit of the permanent crown. That, that No, our answer in the laboratory is not to say anything. This is like the hairpiece story. The labs are like my ex-wife in this scenario, leaving the brochure out, except this time the brochure says, don't worry about your temporaries. We're going to design all your crowns, four-tenths of a millimeter, 400 microns, out of occlusion so that you don't have to reinforce the basics with your dental assistant. And we don't have to subtly tell you that there's something that's not being done correctly. And that's why all our crowns are high. And so that's been the problem is that the lab is silently adjusting this and not telling the dentists. And dentists are shocked when they hear this, but it starts in their offices because of the temporaries being over polished and not having that centric stop. So we need to make sure our assistants are not touching, you know, a great way to train it is when you take the temporary out from the pre-impression, you know, to take a red pencil and mark the contact on the mesial and distal, and they're not to polish that at all. They can polish all around it and not touch that. And there needs to be that occlusal stop also marked and not polished. Of course, you can add it back on with like flowable composite, uh, but our temporaries need to have centric stops and tight uh, interproximal contacts. We need to polish the interproximal surfaces of the adjacent teeth before we take the impression. But that's why, you know, when I had, when, when Cindy went out and opened her own lab and she said, what should we do? I had two requests. One was do three day crowns. So any dentist who wants to, even if their lab won't do it, even if they ask, please, can I have this back in three days? I'll pay you $10 extra or um, I'll pay you $10 extra for any crown. I don't have to adjust. This will be on the honor system. Uh, but if your lab won't do it, you can at least try and see what a three day crown is like. And my second thing was following Gordon and Rella Christensen's recommendation for the last seven years now, and that is polish zirconia crowns instead of glazing them. So mm -hmm. all the crowns that you get from 38 smiles, um, you get it back in three days if you send a digital impression and the price is really good too. Uh, but also it's all polished zirconia. It's not glazed. So you don't get that initial wear of the opposing tooth that you do with the glaze until the patient wears through that. And so I learned that from Gordon Rella. Her SEMs have been showing that for years. But most labs won't polish zirconia crowns because it takes more time to polish in the occlusal surface. It's way easier to spray some glaze on it and run it up in the oven while you do something else. So I like that that 38 Smiles Dental Lab is taking a stand, Kirk, and they're doing what we know in the lab industry is right, and that is turning things around as quickly as possible in three days and not polishing zirconia unless the dentist asks for it for some reason. Now, on an anterior crown, on a front tooth, they still glaze the facial so that it's got that nice, shiny, wet look to it. Um, but on the lingual, where the lower anterior teeth are going to include with the crown, it's all polished zirconia so we don't wear those lower anterior natural teeth that are in contact with that. So that's what reshaping the lab industry uh, really looks like to me, is to do things that are in the best interest of the tooth, in the best interest of the patient. It's in the dentist's best interest too, because when you put in crowns after three days, they drop into place with very few, if any, adjustments. And then it, it kind of forces you to dip your toe into um, the, the digital ecosystem of digital impressions to get them back in three days. And for most dentists who are taking good polyvinyl impressions, taking good care of the soft tissue, um, digital impressions are just a natural step up and they give you the ability to do so many more things, including measure how much reduction you did on the tooth. So you're not gonna get that phone call from the lab saying, hey, we need one millimeter for Emacs and you only gave us 0 0.78 millimeters. What would you like us to do. So it's this is the right direction for everybody to head. Um, the, the labs just are kind of unwilling uh, to blow it open because they would need to hire a lot more employees to be able to turn things around a little bit faster. And, and frankly, Kirk, the dentists aren't asking for it. So there's no real reason for the labs to change. Labs didn't get Emacs until dentists start, or Empress until dentists started asking for it. We launched Sala Zirconia, a Bruxer at Glidewell, and it wasn't until 
dentists start asking their labs for it, that zirconia start being incorporated. So Dennis, you have a voice. You drive a lot of what the laboratory does, way more so than you do with manufacturers. Laboratories, when you ask them or two or three dentists ask them for something, they have to pay attention. They have to make a decision about whether or not they want to follow this. And um, that that's really where we need to move things towards this three-day seating and, and polish, polish zirconia. And again, some way of knowing that we've prepared enough to structure because right now you know the labs have jumped in front of dentists when it comes to digital technology you know all of a sudden every lab has a scanner every lab is milling restorations and dentists have been very slow to embrace scanning and so you know for 30 years kirk we really had a good ride in dentistry and i apologize to the young dentists that you didn't get to experience this but for 30 years we got to just do a prep and then eyeball it we'd like prep an upper second molar pull the cheek back close one eye stare back there and goes yeah that looks good then we'd send it to the lab and they wouldn't say anything because we write them a check every month and right. so we, we we get to just push our stuff on them and uh, now the laboratories even if you send them a regular polyvinyl impression, they're going to pour it in stone and then scan it. And with two clicks of a mouse, they can see to the hundredth of a millimeter how much you reduced. And it's not a good look for dentists. You know, you can tell that we're not very scientific about how we prep. We right. And that we call ourselves artists. <laughs> or we say, oh, I'm being conservative. No, you're not being conservative. Conservatism is all only exists in treatment planning. If you're conservative, you can you can um treatment plan like a cast gold crown for a second molar and if the patient doesn't want gold then you can treatment plan a solid zirconia crown conservatism is not saying you want to do emax and then prepping less than a millimeter that's just wrong that's not being conservative conservatism happens in the treatment planning and once you treatment plan and the patient accepts it now there are rules for how much you have to prepare for the material not to break and to look good. There's no creativity here. The creativity is in that other part. Now it's time to have a checklist. Now it's time to be like a pilot in an airplane and look at the checklist and somebody says, are the flaps at 20 degrees? And you put the flaps at 20 degrees and say, yes. In dentistry, we don't have a checklist. The assistant says, did you prep a millimeter and a half? And we just close one eye and go, looks like it. And then we send it off to the lab. Yeah. Now go back to that. Now I'm going to kind of lead you with this question because I've seen you and you and I have talked about this and you're one of the few people that sees both sides of the bench behind the bench. And on the other side, if we were to get lab, maybe that might be another good string of episodes. Like what would the lab tech really say? Because you pointed to it earlier. It's one of those delicate relationships. And I worked in a lab many years ago where as a lab tech, you don't want to say too much because you don't want to lose the dentist. But if we got the lab techs on today, and said there were, you get three things to say. What would be the three things you would coach your best dentist to do more of or do better at um, so that we get a better result? What would they be if if the lab techs really had a great voice on this show? Well, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be coaching their their best clients. That's just the thing. Like if you ask any laboratory owner or any lead technician, like at a dental laboratory, and you said, uh, if you broke a tooth tomorrow and needed a crown, who would you go see? And instantly they'll give you three names. And you're like, oh, are those um, are those doctors the cheapest? And you're like, I, they'll say, I have no idea what they charge. I just see preps and impressions all day long and theirs look great. So technicians know exactly who they would go see. In fact, they're the only ones who really know what's happening. Like as dentists, we can all brag to each other. We can take our best slides and our best preps and go show them at a lecture and everybody can ooh and ah, but the only one who knows the truth is the dental technicians who see everything coming in on a daily basis because you can't just judge a dentist by one impression, but you can by 10 or 15 and, and you'll know what's going on. So they wouldn't say anything to their best clients. Really the ones I set out to help at Glidewell were the dentists with the highest remake percentages. Now I, I was practicing inside of a Glidewell Laboratories. Again, Cindy was my technician. She was down the hallway. Oftentimes, if we were doing something like Bruxer solid zirconia, we had six different Bruxer departments within Glidewell. So they'd all make crowns for me and I'd try them all in. So I I kind of had the, the best of the best of what you can expect from practicing in a laboratory. Even with all that, my remake rate for Crown of Bridge was right around 6%. So that means, Kirk, for every 100 crowns that Cindy gave me, 94 went in with no problem, and then six needed to be remade. Maybe it was shade, maybe it was fit, maybe it was the impression, whatever it might be. Um, and you almost, when 94 of them go in, you almost don't 
remember the 6% that don't because it feels like such a rarity. Like, oh, wow, we haven't had a remake in like, what, three weeks, four right. weeks? Because you've got so many of these that are um, successful. Um, the, the, the dentist who I started to notice when I really started looking at remake rates, because no dentist measures this. It's crazy. But if you want to know what your remake rate is, call your lab and at, well, hopefully they'll tell you the truth. I don't know if they will, because at Glidewell, we wouldn't even always necessarily tell um, uh, P. I would tell them the truth. But if you called the lab, you might not get a straight answer because I started to see dentists who had remake rates of 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. And it's just like, oh, my God. Like, can you imagine having a 50 percent remake rate where every other crown? Oh. doesn't fit that's amazing to me that those people are still dentists and that they haven't like gone to be a barista or gone to real estate or something else because it's like what a difficult way to work and i started to really feel for these people and have a real appreciation for these dentists because i mean kirk just the spirit the unbreakable spirit there to still do this and even after a couple of crowns not fitting so like you're uh the doctor looks at the crown, the assistant goes, you think this one's going to fit? And the doctor takes out a quarter and flips it and goes, uh, heads, no, I don't think it will. Um, it, it's to go on and to still tell the truth to the patient, even by after being beaten down by crown of bridge dentistry, to try a crown in the patient's mouth and go, ah, it doesn't quite fit. If you were my sister or my mom, we would remake this. Um, let's remake it. Those are the amazing dentists. The scary dentist, Kurt? are the ones with the 0% remake rate. If God were a dentist, he'd have a 2% remake rate because you still just can't control everything in the universe. Um, and there's dentists with 0% remake rates who send hundreds of units in a year to the lab. And you realize those are the dentists with no quality control filter. They, if they could just put it on and the patient get their teeth together, mix the cement and boom, on it goes. And so- um, yeah. Can we Go back to this, like, because I want to examine this because we talk to young dentists about this and I, I'm not an expert, but remake, how much is a remake? Break it down dollar cents, dollars and cents. Like some people might say, oh, I'm only at a 10% remake. Like what's the economic impact of a remake? Well, it, it depends on your laboratory. You know, if, you, if you're using a lab um, like Glidewell, Glidewell has a no fault remake policy. Uh, you know, their crowns are whatever, $99. So um it's you know, so you get the 99 dollars for free but that's not that's not the big deal it's your fixed overhead that's probably between 400 and and 600 an hour that that just got lost but really the, the the worst thing is that you now have to most likely reappoint that patient to have them come back to reanesthetize maybe touch up the prep and get a new impression say next tuesday at 10 a.m it's that lost opportunity cost next tuesday of having the patient back and not being able to be productive within that 45 minute appointment next tuesday at 10 a.m it's that ability whatever you were going to produce an hour that is now gone you probably lost a little bit of the patient's confidence as well because they've never met the lab. You can blame it on the lab. As the lab, we encourage you to blame it on us. Why not? We're this faceless third party that's not there, but it doesn't really make them feel any better that they're going home with some plastic in their mouth for yet another two weeks or, or however long um, it's going to be. So you'd have to add up your fixed overhead, the lost opportunity cost of next Tuesday and kind of the loss of patient confidence, but you can't Losing next Tuesday at 10 a.m., the more that starts to happen, that, that just gets really oh. expensive. And it's far more of a lost cost than the $99 that Glide was going to pick up the tab for. Well, and it's more expensive as you get older. When you're younger, you can make those mistakes. When you get older, you're like, that's really expensive is the time aspect. I have like 90 questions I want to ask you. But here's one I want to ask you about the lab because you're privy to a lot of conversations. You go to a lot of me. So what can what's on the horizon? It's anyone's guess. but What's happened to dentistry has been revolutionary. You know, no one would have ever dreamed back in 1988 that you'd have digital impressions. Like what, what could you anticipate or what do you hope to see in the next four or five years as you look at the lab process or even restorative dentistry? Well, um, you know, the PFM ruled the roost for, you know, the majority of my career until really until we introduced um, solid zirconia to uh, North American dentist uh, Brooks in uh, 2009. And that really changed everything in the PFM, at least at Glywell is now below 10% uh, for single units, anterior and posterior. And a lot of other labs it's down, maybe not that much, but down significantly. So we've seen this huge shift towards solid zirconia. So the question is how long of a run is zirconia 
uh, going to have. And um, it's not going to be 30 years, um, but it will probably be considering it started in um, 2009. And so, you know, in 2019, it's already at 10 years. Oh, it might have a, a, a 20 year run, but there is something coming that I can't even describe, mainly because I've signed an NDA agreement. But um, the next generation of, of mind boggling uh, dental materials is is being worked on um, right now. And uh, I, I think that the other big thing we're going to see, uh, Kirk, has got to be uh, the introduction of a chair side CAD CAM system um, or software that is truly easy for uh, the general dentist to use. You know, most um, CAD CAM software that you see now has kind of been designed for laboratories who have no problem and, and love using it because it's a huge time savings for them. And when you do something uh, 50 times every day, it becomes a habit very quickly and they're good at it. Uh, but then they take that laboratory software and they usually modify it or, or dumb it down a little bit for dentists to be able to use it. But dentists are still buying 90 features and they're going to use three of them. And those three are a little harder to use than they should be. So th the big change will be a truly value-based, um, easy to use. And by easy to use, I mean, if you do a digital impression of the tooth, it needs to propose a crown for you. That's not going to need to be, this proposal is not going to need to be touched nine out of 10 times where you can just send it right to um, either a printer, probably, probably a printer, probably not a milling machine like we're doing now. That's not a great way to do, I mean, it's a good way to do things but we're seeing in digital dentures, something we could have never imagined 30 years ago, that uh, 3D printing is definitely the future there, even though most of them are being milled. So we're gonna see this advancement in terms of simplicity for a chair side CAD CAM system where the 80% of crowns, 85% of crowns dental dentists do that are single unit posterior crowns will be done in a dentist's office because they won't need, they'll just need to be polished. They won't need to be um, stained and glazed or possibly centered. The anterior stuff, the bridges, the veneers, that all still go to laboratories. I look at the laboratories in the future as being like a specialist. So most dentists do easy endo, and then they send molar endo to an endodontist, or they send periosurgery to a periodontist. There's gonna be like a labodontist basically, where the lab becomes like a specialist, where we're gonna do the easy stuff in our own offices, and then we're gonna send it to the specialist, when it gets difficult and the labs are going to be able to charge more, they'll be doing less units, but they'll be able to charge more because they are specialists and on the more difficult cases. And, um, you know, they should find it in a sense kind of more rewarding, probably doing the things they like rather than churning out these single unit posterior crowns. Um, so I think it'll that relationship will evolve. And for dentists who hate dentures like I do or did kind of still do uh, digital dentures represent a huge step forward. This is not just a marketing term. Digital occlusal splints, that's kind of a marketing term, right. but digital dentures are kind of the real deal in the sense that uh, from the very try-in, you're going to get something that fits way better than your old final dentures did. And so not only is the fit going to be better, but you're going to know it right away and you're going to be able to see. And that fit that you get initially when you try that in is going to follow you all the way to the finished product. And so digital dentures, for de for, for dentists who stop doing dentures and just refer them to a prosthodontist because they're like, ugh. I hate how these things just flop around and they're not placing implants and don't want to do implant retained ones. You need to do a couple of digital denture cases just to see what the difference is, because this is one instance where adding digital to something like dentures uh, is not just a marketing term. It's a, it's a true step forward in, in terms of fit and shrinking the number of appointments. You have to see the patient as well. Yeah, it's awesome. Have you ever thought of a more exciting time to be a dentist? You know, like, I, I just think it's crazy exciting what we can do now what we didn't think was even possible 10, 11 years ago. So I do want to pivot because I only get you for so long and I still, maybe we have to do a follow-up show or a follow-up three shows or maybe once a week. And I want to get into education and people are already asking, like, you're like this rock star who's, who's got like the next tour. And we're always curious, like, who, what's he going to do? What are you up to? And so Allie asked the question, you know, please ask Mike if he's going to do the accidental geniuses again, or, you know, are you going to do another podcast or what are you up to? So let's talk about future of education, podcasting, and then you're also, you have a different view of events even coming up here in the future. So cover those three and what can we expect from Mike Dottola in the future? Uh, well, yeah, they're, they're, I'm actually uh, hosting uh, a live event in a couple of weeks, which is hard to believe in Las Vegas on, on April 16th. What? 
Uh, yeah, for, for CAD rates, it's, it's going to be amazing. And there's going to be uh, some uh, socially distanced dentists there. I don't know what that, yeah, I guess, well, I should say dentist or whatever. It's going to be safe. Um, it's Nevada. There's somebody driving around with like four pounds of heroin in their trunk. I'm sure it's okay if we put a few people uh, in a room who have all probably been uh, vaccinated. And um, there's going to be a couple uh, product launches there that are, are going to be really exciting. So there will be some people there, but this is more a meeting that's going to not only be streamed live, but then live in perpetuity on the video that gets put out from there. And uh, I think this is still a way to do it, Kirk, where we still have speakers go to a place where there is a stage, where there is production value, even if there's only, you know, 30, 40, 50 people in the live audience where it can be seen by thousands um, of, of people. You know, I've some of the clinical videos we did at Glidewell have 3 million views, 2 million views, a million views. We know if you put quality stuff out there, a lot of people will get to take advantage of it, see it and benefit from it. So I don't like, like if you and I, you know, did this in person, um, it would be more fun. It would be more dynamic. It would be, it would just be uh, better. So the idea of getting together and just having seven speakers come together and, and do this like we would on a stage with a limited audience and putting it out there live. I think this is, um, uh, this is going to be good. Of course, we still need our state dental meetings. It's the only chance most dentists get to actually get to go and put their hands um on products and and touch things and so i i think we kind of need those events too ali that was nice to ask about accidental geniuses um i do think um uh he's talking about a podcast i used to do with josh austin who i know has been on your show yeah. because josh told me that awesome story that he uh talked about when he did that lecture for you how angry you made him with your relentless optimism and i thought that was such a when he told me that story he's like so dude terrible. you have to tell that you have to tell how, how Kirk's optimism made you almost suicidal. That's such a good story. I love Josh. And so I know so do I. That story and I felt terrible, but he's like, no, it, it was, it was working for me like in a different way. And I'm like, okay. So, so I'm sure, I'm sure we will, uh, he and I will do something together, uh, in the future. Um, I, I don't know what it'll look like, but we're too, um, we're too connected. Um, not, not to do something, uh, together, but really what, um, what I want to do, Kirk, and I haven't really said this out in, in public um, anywhere yet. And so I want to say this just to um, now I have to do it once I say it on your show, when all your listeners see it. So um, I you know, you were talking about in the beginning with your 13,000 uh, Facebook members and how you put this out onto Facebook and things like that. I don't like Josh. Josh is pretty much addicted to social media. Josh is constantly like <laughs> Josh, Josh is always during the recording of the accidental geniuses josh was on his phone 90 percent of the time <laughs> not looking up something i just said to see if it was true yeah. i think like literally texting people and literally posting things on instagram that had nothing to do with the show i'm that that's not what i'm addicted to. i'm not addicted to social media i'm addicted to weird things like uh watching bicycle races you know uh, uh, on tv and things like that right. over a vpn these european bicycle races so i spend like my time doing other things and but i know that today as a consultant and as uh, somebody who's helping companies working with companies that there is something to be said for this social media presence so really kirk i've been looking for a way to engage myself long term where I'll, I'll want to do something i will have to kind of frequently contribute to it and something where other people will want to watch what's happening um, and, and possibly be involved with it as well. And you do such a good job of interviewing people that I could just look at your list of everybody you've interviewed and then go interview them uh, afterwards. I once thought I would do that with Howard Fran. I just like every guest that he did, I would do like the week after. It'd be like the after show or something like this. Just, just use it as a list. But there's a lot of podcasts where dentists are interviewing other dentists. And so really what I came up with was I started a new Instagram account. I haven't posted anything to this yet. I haven't had to because I haven't put it out in the public yet until now. But it's um, it's called Mike Detola is Losing It. And basically what I want to do is talk about two main things on there. Uh, my mental health struggles. So Josh has been the first one to kind of bring this up. Right. And so Mike Detola is Losing It has been part of me talking about um, what's going on with me and what I've been trying recently, like talking about the ketamine therapy that um, I just got done uh, experimenting with. I mean, not at home. This was actually yeah. done in the, in the right way. And I'm about to start uh, a different type of therapy as well, kind of looking for 
um, answers, um, and that'll be certainly explained. That. And then the Mike Tatola's losing it also is about the fact that um, I dislocated my shoulder and tore some tendons and had shoulder surgery uh, about a year and a half ago. And um, since then, somehow I've managed to gain about 30 pounds since I saw you last, since we lectured together for for Gordon. So Mike Tatola is losing it is also going to be a very transparent look at not only uh, mental health struggles, but me losing the weight in real time. And that means stepping on the scale in whatever shorts Kirk picks out for me to wear that particular day uh, and, and taking a picture of me on the scale along with the number and then just kind of showing what um, I might have done that day in terms of uh, exercise or what uh, healthy choices I may, may have made in terms of, of what I'm eating and then just kind of tracking this process with slip ups and all yeah. of, lo of losing it in terms of uh, physically losing the weight and mentally trying to combat the losing it feeling that I have um, uh, mentally with this with this you know condition that uh, that I have, and so um, being able to tie that together, and it feels like something where uh, Dennis, who are watching, might want to join in and might want to say, "Ooh, I've been meaning to lose twenty pounds too. I want to be kind of right. part of this," and they'll start posting kind of their own journey as well. And I'd like to have a community like that. I really wanted to do this at Serona. Serona never really bought into it, but I wanted to do it on a per office basis where literally it was at our big annual meetings, like the CEREC meetings, we'd have whole offices get on a big industrial scale at the same time, all at the same time. So you didn't know what any one employee weighed and then actually reward um, reward the office that got to their goal weight or, or lost the most by the next meeting. And I know I just know what I'm supposed to weigh, Kirk. I know I've got very small wrists and small bones and I, I know where my ideal weight is. I know where my ideal triathlon weight is. That's not a super healthy weight, but I know where my healthy weight is. And it's about 30 pounds from where I am now. And it's very easy to actually have to work pretty hard to put that on in two and a half years. I'll be honest. It, it took a lot of dedication. I'm hoping to use that same dedication to the process of losing it. And so I hopefully there'll be other dentists who find themselves in, or, or staff members or whoever that finds himself in the same place, not you, because you're the picture of health. No, no, no. I, I need, I need this, Mike, because <laughs> the pandemic was not pleasant to me. I mean, I, I, I compensate stressfully with food and drink. Like I, for some reason, even my kids were like, "Dad, you got to do something." So I think this would be powerful. The other thing, Mike, is you're so good at being authentic. And um, not only are you wicked smart, but I think that's what the world needs is just an honest approach. And you and I both know the older you get, the more your filter goes away. So you're not necessarily trying to please everybody, but just make a connection. And I think it's it's awesome. I love your idea. I absolutely it, love it. It's very, it's very selfish on my part, I'll be honest. You know, I, I mean, I've wanted to lose the 30 pounds, but it's kind of like, um, you know, you, I almost need, I need a community. So if there's like, when I was at Glidewell, um, we had a weight loss contest years and years ago and right. I won. I lost at the time like 35 or 40 pounds. That's when I started doing Ironman triathlons. And then it just crept back up because of the surgery, because of my mental, not taking care of myself mentally uh, right. as often as I should. Um, and then the surgery and then the pandemic. So it all just kind of added up. And like you, uh, I soothed myself through uh, food and drink and, and things like that. I love when so I love when people are under stress and they go, I, I can't eat. You know, I lost 10 pounds. I'm like, F <laughs> you. How dare you? How dare you? You're so lucky. I Come wish on. I had your stress. I have the other kind of like, you know, weight gain, um, weight gain stress. So I know if I have a community like of people who are doing it with me, that it's fun. It's more fun. It kind of gamifies, you know, weight loss um, in a sense. And I know that I need accountability as well. And, um, you know, if you're with somebody who loves you, regardless of what you look like, I mean, unconditional love is great, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like easy to take it for granted. And, and I'm sure Lindsay would rather see me at my ideal weight. And so, um, the accountability of taking pictures of myself on the scale and am I going to really sit down Kirk? Like I did in the last two years with that pint of the Haagen-Dazs peanut butter and chocolate. Am I going to eat that whole thing or eat it at all? 
knowing that I'd have to post it or knowing that I'm going to every other day, I'm going to be on the scale with a picture of myself in shorts without a shirt on. Am I really going to want to do that? So um, well, maybe I we might. Can figure every time you open it, you have to just start an Instagram live or something like that. And we'll join you. through. That's every, good. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. let's start the accountability process right now. Cause you know, I love you. I, and I want to see this. And you mentioned to me, you're like, gosh, as soon as I say this, I got to do it now. So <laughs> I'm going to make you do it. And I want to file. I'll, I'll ask people to follow and we're going to get you back. Maybe we could do a monthly like check in with Mike because he's losing it type of a thing. You know okay. what I mean? What do you think? Yeah, I, oh, I'd absolutely love that. I would I would talk to you all day, uh, every day, Kirk. So I would, uh, would. A- absolutely love to um, to be able to do that with you. And I will. I will be totally uh, honest and, and transparent about it because, um, you know, you and I were saying, um, I think it was before we started recording that, um, you know, the thing that... Um, really matters is getting feedback from people saying, Ooh, you changed my practice or you made uh, a crown preps. You know, I, I use your technique and they look better and they're less stressful than they were before. Or my remakes are done. That that's really what sticks with you is, is helping uh, other people. I mean, that's the truly meaningful stuff. M- money's nice, but you know, you don't have to, you realize pretty quickly that money's kind of this never ending. I mean, anything could be this never ending thing of uh, trying to fill this, like I'm speaking for myself, this hole inside of you with um, alcohol, food, Vicodin, money, you name it. And it's just never enough. It's like, you know, you enjoy it for half a second and it's um, on to the next thing, but he- helping people always feels different. You know, it, get, it gets you out of your head and, and somebody else, all of a sudden it feels much more worthwhile that somebody else says, Oh, uh, I saw what you were doing. And um, I lost 10 pounds and I ran my first 10K and I'm much healthier now. And, uh, you know, I I was worried if I was going to make it to my daughter's wedding or whatever it might be. So um, I'm also secretly hoping that people do uh, get involved that way and that um, have the ability to just maybe be um, an impetus. I think a lot of times all um, all sometimes we need to do the right thing as a coach or an inspiration. And uh, I like the idea of the coaching. And uh, this is a chance for the people who follow this account to kind of be my coach and keep me accountable. But there's other people we can look to as well. So I I think, I think, you know, at least for myself, I'm looking for, um, everybody knows diet, (laughs) diet and exercise, especially diet is the key to doing this. It's just a matter of what's going to inspire you and what's going to uh, get you to want to do it yourself. So hopefully, um, it can have some beneficial, you know, some beneficial effects for people besides myself. Right. Especially dentists. Cause dentistry is not a profession. It's a sport. I mean, you know, I can't remember who said it, but you know, I work as long as these work, you second, your back goes out. You know, it's, it's one of those things that your ability to practice dentistry is greatly dependent on how healthy you stay, no matter what the excuse is. So I think there'll be a lot of people willing to join the journey with you. Now, I got to ask you this because you, again, education, and I don't know the answers to this. And you and I were talking about this. You've done a lot of podcasting and you're going to embark on a new, why is the audio information? Like, I mean, we're, we're, you and I are guessing right now, but you know, you've got views, millions and millions of views on videos and then audio and young dentists are telling me, gosh, I love the audio. Any hypothesis, like give me where the future of education and engagement might go in dentistry and why this trend is so powerful now. Like any guess? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's, um, a couple of things. I think it's, um, uh, the community of being able to listen to someone on a a weekly basis where, you know, one or more, uh, of the characters. I, I, I think part of it is, um, just the earbuds themselves, you know, the fact that it's like, uh, I don't know, half an inch from our brain, however far these are where it's, it's just more this immersive, um, experience. Um, the video education, um, there's gotta be something worth showing, gotta be impressions or preps or, or teeth. And now somebody's kind of tethered to wherever they're sitting. Uh, even back in, um, as far back as, you know, 2015. So like six years ago, I guess that's not that far back, but six years ago, or maybe more seven, eight, nine years ago, um, already 65% of the views of the online Glidewell information we were putting up was on mobile devices. And I'm sure it's only gone, uh, I'm sure it's only gone up from there. And and you knew that had to be kind of the younger generation 
um, of dentists because the you know the older dentists. I mean, you hear my reluctance to get involved with social media. I'm 56, and it's not like I don't look at Instagram, but it's not. I, I look at comedians on Instagram. I'm not really looking at for for dentists. And then I start following a, a couple dentists, but again, it's just not my go-to of going to do it. And so I was. That's the whole Mike Tatola is losing is how am I going to engage myself in this and want to see it and want to and want to uh, put stuff up content every day because I am thinking weird thoughts every day that I'd like to put up as part of as part of all of this as well. Um, but I think the ability to listen to it on the way to work um, and, and ever since the lockdown, I probably listen to two or three hours of podcasts a day, Kirk, just uh, wow. when I'm doing something, if I'm writing something that's not you know, mission critical, like a script for something. If I'm just like typing out emails, I've got a podcast on. I'm listening um, in the shower. I've got a waterproof speaker. I'm listening to it while I shave my head and then um, and shower. Um, you know, not so much when I'm on my indoor bike. I'm usually watching something, you know, watching a, a bike race on TV. But otherwise, I'm pretty much listening to a podcast during the day. Part of that is my has to do with my... Um, my mental condition, which I'm uh, specifically not revealing now, just because I need some reveal on my own show, Kirk. But um, so I feel like I put out like what I'm doing, but uh, I want to leave some mystery as to what what is actually how broken I am, what's actually what's actually going on in my head. Um, so I need some kind of reveal for that. But I, I just think it's the ability to kind of multitask. I love long form. I, I think most of us grew up where CNN's got eight people on the screen. They go to this guy for 29 seconds and this guy for 20. And it's just such a horrible way right. uh, to communicate. And so, you know, this kind of long form interview, you can only hide so much. You know, you're going to ask enough questions where you kind of get to the essence of uh, of somebody. And um, it's it's really an entertaining form and it goes back to something you said earlier in my mind like even if like, like if you go to joe rogan's podcast some of these three hour podcasts or pete holmes sometimes gets close to that um as well it's um it's all about authenticity and so that really is what is is kind of the core issue that it comes down to for me is that um you know in a stand-up act when you see a comedian there might be some authenticity you know but it's like uh uh, so this thing happened to me last week. It's like, oh, sure it did. If it ever happened, it was probably four years ago. You know, it's like, oh, last week I was in the blah, blah, blah. So, so there's, you know, I mean, maybe they're telling their, you know, truth in a way, but it's also, you know, I, I feel like in these longer formats like this, um, even if you go see me lecture, you know, you're hearing my opinions and things like that. It's just rare to hear somebody talk for an hour. And that's why I like on the podcast I was doing, and that's going to be the format of the other one is not asking the clinical dentist who I look up to so much about dentistry, but asking about their best day and worst day in practice and best day and worst day as a speaker or living in Texas or wherever they live or whatever their hobbies are and hopefully getting people to do it. And a couple of people I've interviewed said, wow, this is the first podcast I ever recorded that I listened to afterwards. Right. And, uh, and I, and I really liked it. And just to point out one guest, Rob Ritter, who was on a couple of weeks ago, sent me something, said, God, I'm getting a lot of feedback from people who really liked it because Rob talked about growing up wanting to be an astronaut, you know, and, right. and, uh, and, and really just you got to know Rob growing up in the restaurant business, him busting his ass working for this Italian family. And that I love stories about uh, Dennis with summer jobs. Gordon Christensen, our good friend. Do you know what his job was in high school? No, I didn't. He managed a Dairy Queen. Wow. It's such a good story. I'm like, Gordon, you have to, you're already a legend. If you talk about managing a Dairy Queen and doing those, uh, what are they? I don't even remember what it's called. Blizzards. Yeah. Blizzard, they do the blizzard. yeah. And then Gordon shaking it upside down to show it doesn't come out. Feels like a CR test on a composite. I mean, it's just a great story. We were talking once. I was like, um, you're so efficient. There's no wasted movement. You know, when I'm up there in Utah watching him do dentistry. He goes, you know where else I was really like that? I'm like, where? He goes, killing chickens on my grandfather's farm. I was like, what? I can't goes, see him doing that. Yeah, yeah, no. He goes, we they had a chicken farm there, and there would come times where you had to cull the chickens, and the easiest way to do it was just breaking their necks. He said most people would kill three, three or four chickens in an hour. He said, I was at 10 and 12 chickens an hour. I'm like, how are you not telling these stories? in your lectures, managing a Dairy Queen and being the best chicken killer you've ever seen, 
you're already a legend. These would take you, but that's just not his. Um, but if I had him on the podcast, those are the stories I'm going for. But you're the kind of guy that could extract that kind yeah, of information and make it extra interesting. See, I would watch that all day long. And Ritter's story is awesome. And it's funny that you say that. So I interviewed Adamo a few weeks ago, and he was a garbage man. I'm like, no way. I, I have known you. I, I didn't know you were a garbage man. He's like, yeah, I was a garbage man. Like, being a dentist is easy garbage man was hard. He talks about how many cans he threw per day. And he was like, I couldn't even lift my arms after the first day. Cause his dad was a garbage man. And he was like, that's all the motivation I needed to go back. And that make- also explains his obsession with rubber dam. Yes. Yeah, wanted, wanted to keep the trash and the dirty stuff away. <laughs> but wanted to put that down, just being as far away from filthy things as possible. It's crazy. Now go back to the a comedian thing, because when you were saying that, I'm like, that's exactly true. Now I'm in the same place you are. I hate social media, but my, the, my marketing guy is like, okay, repeat after me. I hate social media, but I love what it does for right. the business or anything. And I'm like, okay, I totally get it. And I follow a few comedians. I'd love to know who yours are. I follow Sebastian Manig. Maniscalco. Maniscalco. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like I I've seen him on stage and that is absolutely hilarious. But when he comes out of a, like eating, eating sushi with a real Japanese group, like it is hilarious. And I have to watch every second of it and he's in his car and like, so who do you follow when you're, when you're following somebody on? Um, I love uh, Neil Brennan. Who did? Uh, oh, I don't know that. Who is Neil, that? Neil Brennan is the um, co-creator of the Dave Chappelle Show. So he and Dave Chappelle created um, the Chappelle Show, which is arguably the greatest sketch comedy show uh, to ever ever be on TV. I mean, sorry SNL, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you've had more longevity, but I think they they broke more ground. And so then he's gone on to do um, other things, including. Um, a one man show called uh, uh, Three Mics that's on Netflix, and he has three different microphones. Oh, and Josh so, mentioned that. I yeah, yeah. That. Jo- Josh and I both are obsessed with this, and we both got to see Neil um, right before the pandemic. Josh flew out. We went, Josh and I went and stayed at a hotel together um, that's next door to the comedy store up in um, Hollywood. Awesome. And all we all we did was go to live comedy shows for the next two days. It was uh, it was so great, and we we can't wait to do that again. So we finally got to see our our hero Neil Brennan. I had seen him before because he lives out in Southern California, but uh, Josh got the chance to see him. Um, Josh and I absolutely adore Anthony Jeselnik. I don't know if you know who Anthony Jeselnik no, I don't is. Know him either J E S E L N I K. He's not for um, everybody. He's not dirty but he's um, shocking. So his new special fire in the maternity ward is kind of, is mind blowing. And and Josh and I got to see him test out some new stuff at the comedy store. And that I know that was one of the greatest moments of both of our, both of our lives to see him um, trying out uh, new stuff live, which is what a lot of people, the the comedy stores kind of become known for that. And so you really get to see the process as much as the final joke. And probably in terms of content, just the guy putting out the funniest stuff is Kyle Dunnigan. So D U N N I G A N Kyle Dunnigan. Just, I mean, it's just, it's otherworldly. The kind of stuff that, that he does with um, technology and other stuff. That's insanely hilarious. His ability to do voices and other things. And that's what, you know, I'm kind of looking for when, when, when I go to, uh, social media largely. And I grew up in an era where you had to go to a lecture to get information, you know, and then it became, you could watch a YouTube video. So I don't want to say Kirk that um, I don't like social media. I spent so much time on YouTube. I spent, I'm constantly, you can learn how to do surgery, any dental procedure. I investigate, you know, all kinds of, um, uh, of therapies that I'm thinking about doing. Neil Brennan has had all these therapies for his, uh, long-term depression as well, and has been very open, you know, talking about what what he's tried to do as well. So I'm, uh, I love YouTube because you can learn so much from it. I've just never felt the same way about Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, and Instagram is you can get a graduate degree if you watch enough things right. on YouTube because it's all out there. You can find any TV show. You can find any commercial from the 70s. To me, it's this unbelievable. It, it is what the it's the promise of the internet. It feels like YouTube, not, not creators, not, not people who are necessarily like uh, unboxing videos or things like that, but to be able to tap into this wealth of knowledge 
um, that's out there is insane to me. And, um, you know, but but I didn't grow up in an era where um, of being inspired by looking at things on Instagram. So once I'm knee, knee deep in it myself, um, I certainly expect to, and once I understand a little better, be able to know kind of my way around it, because Instagram just sees like this hodgepodge of copycat features, you know, of everything else that's come out since Instagram launched. And there's IGTV and there's stories and there's reels and there's, you know, so in my mind, I'm like, can I just create the content and give this to somebody and you put it where it needs to go? I'll do funny stuff on a daily basis or every right. other day with the weight loss and what I'm doing with the metals. I'll record all this stuff and then you break it up and do it. But people keep saying, no, do it yourself. Learn, you know, learn how to do it, learn where it should be. And then you can kind of delegate it if you want. So we'll see. I can't wait. So, so we can expect this in the next couple of weeks or like we talk, we talk in next couple of weeks, next couple of months. Give us I'll, some I'll give myself four weeks to get it out. Okay, four weeks. But yeah. I had to I had to say it first and put it out there. And maybe I should gain. You know how the first pounds come off really easy? Oh. Maybe I should spend the next two weeks putting on another 10. Just <laughs> just to well, the really net loss is a little bit higher, you know, it's a little bit more dramatic. Kirk, let me let me ask you this because uh, right. I, I don't know whether or not posing in boxer briefs, not the loose ones the tighter ones just for the <laughs> humiliation, I suppose. Uh, but shirt or no shirt. No, no shirt feels way more vulnerable. Um, you get older, you start to get man boobs. I realize, by the way, I'm fat shaming myself, right. um, but, but I don't think I can get canceled for shaming myself, but it's not even it's, it's fat. I can fat shame myself because I know how I got here. Right. I got here by doing things that were purposefully unhealthy intentionally self-destructive behaviors that I let happen without trying to do it. So, um, I, of course, shame never does work, but I, I realized by saying this, um, I'm not calling myself fat, not knowing myself. I know what I'm supposed to weigh. So right. nobody else gets to tell me what I'm supposed to I know what I'm supposed to weigh, and I'm 30 pounds over that. But no shirt could also be just like, Ugh, why follow this? So I'm wondering, T-shirt? or no t-shirt or Uche Odiatu t-shirt where you can actually see like uh, a geographical relief of what's happening around your. So it looks like sausage casing when you put it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I'm wearing it. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think, I think, uh, I think it'll be met with unconditional love. I, I would probably take two photos and then, you know, do like a, it. Yeah. A, B, it. Okay. Hey, look, and that might be your first post. Hey, okay. look, I'm watching this thing, shirt or no shirt and watch the feed just go and and then take a vote i don't know i don't All know right. how instagram works but i don't know if they have a voting <laughs> feature or anything but you know they do i do know they have a voting feature yeah, really? I, i've been watching youtube videos on instagram on how to produce instagram so, oh they absolutely have polls where, okay yeah, yeah you can take a poll. so once you figure this out we're gonna do a tutorial for everyone that's older than 50 on how to yeah, use exactly. instagram and the things that you've learned every single month on mike's losing it what do you think <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I guess that what it'll that's what it'll be too is like watching this. Yeah, guy in his mid fifties. I'm not as bad as my dad watching him text. You know, when he does something, it's not that. Right. But I also look at yeah, I also look at Josh and like his. He's got an Instagram story like uh, every day. He puts so he obviously like set a goal for himself. I haven't even asked him this, but he must have set a goal for himself to do it. And it's like when you see it. Or when I see people do it and it's good, I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, I, I'm, I'm, right. I guess I'm better off, you know, for having seen that. But I don't just want it to be um, me like looking at the follows and how many people liked it. I want to put something out there where I'm doing it for myself anyway. And frankly, right. it shouldn't matter to me how many people are liking it or not liking it. If they're interacting and, and helping me on, on this journey and helping themselves – that's cool too, but I'm trying not to be attached to like how many people like, like yeah. you know, like it or not that kind of dopamine thing. So I don't know. Yeah. And I'm not one to tell you what to do. Cause I don't know what to do, but I would disagree with the people that are telling you learn how to do. It. I mean, Gary Vanderchuk made what he's do like. Somebody just followed with him with, with a camera. Now some of it he does on his own, but very little. He is just being him all himself all day. And I'm quite certain he doesn't look back and see how many likes he has. He's just right. on to the next thing. And I think you're going to be better served just being Mike losing it instead of wondering how the heck do I, do I put this on my story? Do I make it a post? Do I do a reel? I mean, I'm, 
I mean, I got a 20 year old daughter who's like out and I don't even know what she did, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I can't wait to see it. I'm going to join the, uh, I'll be part of your community. I I need the inspiration like anybody else, but, uh, we can't wait, buddy. Well, I was happy just to join the act dental, um, Facebook group. So I'll I'll be sure to kind of mention it in there to, uh, you know, once again, put it out into the ether so that I have to do it. That's really what it was. It was, you know, well, I've been thinking about this and talking about this for four weeks. It's time to breathe it into existence so that I actually am forced to start Dude, you you know, coming it. up with the mechanics of how I'm going to do this. You got to do it. I mean, I, you know, when you, whenever you and Josh are doing anything, whether it be together or separate, like it is outrageously hilarious. When, a lot of times the podcast, I'll just listen to Josh on the way home, just you know, I got to make sure there's no kids in the car, right. but it is awesomely just like entertaining. And, and I agree that that human side of where you're headed with some of the greatest names in dentistry, that's, that's a, that's a box that hasn't been opened yet. Well, my, um, my speaking career turned around years ago when I started telling the truth, when I started telling the average dentist story, when I start saying, admitting I was an average dentist and I've heard Gordon say this before. And I'm like, shut up. You don't get to say that. You do. I've, I've seen you freehand implants. I've seen you. You don't get to say that. When I say I'm an average dentist, I qualify it by, right. well, there, there's kind of a story that I tell, but it ends up that I was in remedial operative in dental school. So I'm not lying. I was literally having to go in on Saturdays while the other dental students were out playing around San Francisco. I was there doing more and more preps. And as soon as I got honest about that, started talking about that, all of a sudden I started getting booked everywhere and then and then the same thing kind of happened when um i told the hairpiece story at sarek 27 and a half and then took it out of my pocket and set it on my my head again and um you know and kind of told that story and it's like that those are those are what create connection with the audience you know it's not it's not about you know look how they want to connect with you in a um you know kind of a different role than what you do in dentistry right right now and Mm -hmm. and so or and, and anytime you're honest and you're not the hero of your own story. And it will be hard to be the hero standing on a scale in my underwear, I feel like. So this feels like to me um, the chance to do kind of one of those same things and go, you know what? As somebody who grew up lying constantly, I used to think, I swear to you, I'm not even kidding, Kirk. I used to think growing up that telling the truth was for people who weren't smart enough or creative enough to come up with good lies. Right. Where'd you grow up? Like Detola, were you, were you an East coast, uh, like West coast? Like- no, Southern, Southern California here in Southern California, this little city called Downey. And I don't want to tip too much about uh, the show just yet, but I don't remember a single thing from the first nine years of my life. Wow. And, and that that's, you know, part of what has come up in therapy. And that's one of the reasons why I'm looking at these alternative therapies like ketamine therapy is to try to get access um, to these memories that I don't have, because that's not normal. Not to, you know, every every therapist has told me it's not normal not to remember anything from the first nine years of your life. And there's other things that happen in my life where there's um, traumatic events. I have little hints of it just from what relatives have told me about things that happened, but I've never been able to. My brain has, you know, it sounds like Pink Floyd the Wall. My brain has built a wall. Um, around something or maybe it's a maybe my body did it around my brain where i won't be able to access these certain things that it perceives as um too painful to to re-experience but it's really holding me back in terms of um interpersonal intimacy which people find really strange because i'm so comfortable standing right. up in front of a group of six thousand and yeah. talking and telling stories and, and making them laugh but that's that's easy to me the, the yeah. hard stuff is um the one-on-one intimate stuff and looking somebody right um right in the eye and uh so i'm i'm glad you know without whatever happened in those first nine years of my life i don't think my brain would work like it does and i'm happy with what it does i'm happy about all the nice things you said about me being funny and and being entertaining and being able to hold people's attention while I'm also hopefully slipping in some dental education uh, right. at the same point. So I don't want to get rid of it, but I can't, there's things that I can't get past and things that happen where I, I, I can see now reading about, you know, PTSD that until you get access um, to those memories, somehow it's, it's pretty tough to kind of deal with them and to turn off that flight or fight response where, 
your amygdala and your hippocampus kick in thinking that there's a threat to your life and it's not. It's just, it's like a fire alarm going off when it's 80 degrees inside and there's no flames. So that's yeah. that's what I'm looking to help. And so I hope that sharing that part of it as well, you know, mental health is not something we talk about a lot in dentistry. Josh has started it recently, thankfully, kudos to him. Oh, okay. um, but, but we've always heard how many suicides there are in dentistry. Josh actually has an article from Vice kind of showing that. Right. And we barely talk about ergonomics, about keeping your neck and back healthy, let alone keeping your brain healthy. And, and this is a, you know, demanding uh, a job in terms of not only physical position, but in terms of caring and nurturing and, and, and helping patients who have their own phobias related to dentistry and being patient and, and all that stuff. And uh, so to do that, if you're not uh, in a good place yourself is, is very difficult and it's very easy to then take that on when something inside you hasn't been nurtured or nourished and it's very easy for me to have a day like that walk out of there and feel like oh it's time to have that pint of haagen or it's time to have this bottle of wine uh, be just to numb that you know to kind of keep that down and keep from having to to feel that so as much as we've talked about the weight loss i secretly hope that making all this stuff uh public and talking about that will um you know, that's kind of the bigger thing. I mean, they're both important, mind and body, but uh, the body's a little more obvious. There's no scale. You know, I can't pose, a, I can't put my brain on a scale and go, whoa, look at all those black areas where it's all damaged. So uh, right. hopefully that will um, help some people as well and maybe get some people to recognize that, um, like it happened very slowly for me, that what I'm experiencing on a, on a sometimes daily basis is not normal and most most people don't feel like this. Right. I don't think it'll be a hit and help a lot of people. I know it will be. Uh, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I can't wait to see more. And then when you officially launch it, we'll do like a mini launch party here so you can explain what's going on Instagram, what those two split test photos meant. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll come out and do it live with you uh, in, in my underwear just for to <laughs> No, I'll... Uh, uh, I, but I would. We'll see. We'll see if we can start traveling again. I mean, I, you know, I, I love, um, you know, I've done a show for ages now for a couple seasons, this product talk. And uh, when we can do it live and we're with the dentist and we're talking, we're sitting there with our knees almost touching like you have to be on a video shoot. Uh, yeah. It's just a great energy. And, and we've been doing um, and this was great. But but you would you know, you and I both have a lot of energy kind of naturally. And you need to have on something like this, you need to have 20 percent more energy than you think for you sure. need. And even on camera, too, to a degree. But it's easier to bring it out of other people when you're sitting there with them Probably. instead of virtually mm -hmm. like this. So I can't wait to get around and be able to go do stuff in person with people again. I don't I don't care about the you know cost of flying to see people. I love that kind of uh, live performance. So it would be fun to come out and do uh, something live together at some point. Like we got to speak at Gordon's meeting that one time. And I remember... I remember um, that meeting. I don't know what he gave you. Gordon gives a gift to every speaker. I don't know if you remember what he gave you. I can't remember. I remember what he gave me because he gave me um, on stage after I was done speaking, he said, we have a little gift for you. And it was the Book of Mormon. And I said, oh, I said, I heard you're going to do this, but I thought it was tickets to the musical. And everybody started cracking up except for Gordon. I don't think he knew what I was talking oh, about. I don't think he had heard of, heard of the Book of Mormon yet. Um, but I still have the Book of Mormon that uh, that Gordon gave me, and I've seen the musical three times. So uh, my yeah. wife took me to that, and I'm like, I don't really. She's and she had already seen it, and she's like, No, I just know you're gonna laugh so hard you can't breathe. I'm like, What? What, what is it about? And she's like, I'm not even gonna tell you. We were in the fourth row. I couldn't breathe by the time the second act happened. I, in the first couple laughs, you're like, Should I be laughing at this? <laughs> But all of the older people in front of me were laughing so hard that it gave me permission to laugh. And then my wife was hitting me in the second act. Like you're laughing so loud that you're, you can't even hear the actors. You know what I mean? So, right. And, pr and um, props to the Mormon church for embracing that. And they just, you know, they ran with it. I, I grew up in the Catholic church. They would have burned the theater down or done, or done something or, or uh, sued them for slander or, or something insane. You know, the Mormon church was very cool how they embraced it, took it all in stride. And uh, we're like, Hey man, we're, we're going to, we're going to ride this wave, you know, and, and for, for what it's worth. And, uh, that was a great example of, uh, of marketing. I thought in terms right. of religion, for sure, for sure. I think at, at the end of the day, we all got to laugh. 
Yeah. And you're a valuable piece to this. And I know that you're going to make a lot of, you're going to inspire people, keep them laughing and it'll be fun to watch you. So I got Neil Brennan. I got to look up uh, Anthony just as <laughs> Kyle oh, yeah. Dunning. And then uh, Mike Detola. I'm going to put him right next to Sebastian Manig Manigalsko. Manigalsko. Yeah. It's Manigalsko. an Italian name. Oh my gosh. It'll be funny. By the way, Jessel, Jessel Nick is J E S E L N I K. And, um, Okay, and it's fire, fire in the maternity ward, and um, maybe I don't know your wife, so I don't know. But if she took you to Book of Mormon, she might be okay with this. Uh, but it's uh, it's these are well crafted, Joe. If you want to see what well crafted jokes look like, even if it's not your your cup of tea, when you see what he he's like, he's like Seinfeld in the sense that he he tries to strip away all the unnecessary words but then every joke has a twist where seinfeld doesn't it's more straightforward um and jeselnik you know the twist is coming you right. know it's coming and you still can't predict what it is or you think it's this way and it's that way and i can watch that so so many times because uh even though now i know because i've memorized it where it's going just seeing the audience not knowing where it's going is such a great, such a great moment. So thank you, Kirk, for having me on. It's been wonderful to spend some time with you today. Oh, buddy, the pleasure's all mine. I enjoy every minute. I get to watch you, talk to you, listen to you, and uh, can't wait for you to roll out your new venture here. So thank you, brother. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. Thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. If you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to hear from Mike. I'll have him back over and over and over again. And we'll even include some of the challenges. Some of the challenges you're going to be doing on Mike's losing. We'll share them on here and then uh, get everybody else involved. But uh, hope you guys enjoy your day and keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.